and I, I had the same like quantum in the beginning. Like, yeah, it's like, Ooh, I can't, I shouldn't take money out of my TSP or 4k. It's a sin, right? We've all been taught that yeah. like, it's naughty. I'm not supposed to do it. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page and we have them in the video or podcast description below. All right. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, so today we have our guest Lane Kawaoka, and he's been investing for over a decade and now controls over 4,200 units. He's the owner of crowdfundaloha.com, simplepassivecashflow.com, and reialoha.com. Lane is responsible for finding investment opportunities and marketing and Lane obtained his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and a master's in civil engineering and construction management from the University of Washington. In addition to analytical engineering background, Lane has real world experience in working as a project manager for over $250 million of capital construction projects in both the public and private sector. Working as a high paid professional in corporate America and frustrated by the traditional wealth building dogma, Lane was compelled to inspire and mentor other working professionals via his top 50 investing podcast at simplepassivecashflow.com. So Lane, really excited to have you on the show. I, I was listening to your podcast, listening to you as a guest on other podcasts, and I'm honored that you uh, reached out and uh, wanted to come on my show. So uh, thank you for uh, for hopping on. Yeah, no problem, man. It's nice to see you. talk to another guy from Hawaii too. Yeah, yeah, right on. You know, I, being able to schedule this at you know, and, and know that we're both locally looking at the time, it's it's you know, eleven o'clock right now. So <laughs> that's pretty awesome. All right, so hey, um, I like to start things off with the same question that I ask everybody, and that's you know, so my audience can get to know you a little bit better. So can you share with us a little bit about yourself and your story? My story kind of started on this linear path. My my parents taught me to go to school, get a good job. We grew up here in Hawaii, so you know. Studying hard was always kind of a big thing, and, and growing up really frugal was another part of my upbringing. But you know, I, I went to school at University of Washington, got an engineering degree, and eventually became an engineer, uh, kind of working in corporate America on the mainland. And again, following all this like bad financial advice out there, like buying a home to live in, which I don't necessarily think is a great idea for a lot of people, um, I bought a home to live in. <laughs> And it took, you know, it took me a couple of years to save up my money because again, very frugal with my money. And I was just never home to enjoy the house because uh, I was working on the road all the time. So I decided to rent it out. The monthly mortgage was 1600. The rents were 2200 bucks a month and to a young 20 something year old kid back then, that was a lot of beer money. And then I started to realize like, hey, this is my ticket out of this rat race. Right on. What a great ticket that is. So bought your first house. It was costing you 1600 a month and then you rented it out for 2200. That is, that is definitely a, a good ROI right there. So, so what are you currently doing on your journey to or in financial freedom right now? Yeah. So that was back in 2009, right? So a long time ago, since that time, I um, started to learn more about buying in secondary and tertiary markets. I uh, started to realize cash flow investors don't buy in places like California, Hawaii, Seattle, New York, Boston. They go after places that cash flow on a month to month basis. And yeah, the, that Seattle, first Seattle property, 2200 bucks a month rent. But the, you know, the purchase price was $350,000. And I would never buy something like that today. You know, today I only buy things that meet that 1% rent to value ratio. 
where you take the monthly rent divided by the purchase price and you're looking for something that's one percent or higher but um but yeah, I just kept buying more and more properties, you know, up until 2015 when I had 11 of those single family home rentals. Fantastic. So uh, for our listeners here, can you explain what uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary markets are and which should should they invest in? Yeah, so primary markets are your, your top tier cities that you all think of, right, that you would think that they'd be good places to invest, like Los Angeles, San Francisco, or I'd probably consider all of California into that category. Seattle, Portland, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., uh, Miami, Florida, Honolulu, Hawaii, right? Or all pretty much the whole state of Hawaii for the most part. You know, these are the top tier markets. You have a lot of dumb money there pushing up prices and the, and the rent to value ratios aren't 1% or higher. So what we try and do is we try and go to these second tier tertiary markets that are places like Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Little Rock, Jacksonville, Florida, places like that where the numbers work. And this is where our strategy clashes with you know mainstream financial thought where you buy low so high, right? It makes sense. But we want a cash flow on a month-to-month basis, and we're pretty agnostic if we make money on the appreciation. We consider appreciation investing gambling. You know, easy come, easy go, it comes up and comes down. Um, we want something that more makes money on a month to month basis, right? Like Warren Buffett says, real number one in investing is don't lose money. How do you ensure that? Well, if you're cash flowing on a month to month basis, right? So like, you know, like a typical property we'll try and target is a you know, $100,000 property that rents for that 1% rent to value ratio or higher. So $1,000 a month. So that $1,000, 10% is going to go to the rents or repairs, 10% is going to go to any CapEx, 10% is going to go to property manager, and then maybe 5 to 10% needs to be put off the side for vacancy and any other mishaps. And then you pay your principal interest taxes after that. Right on. So yeah, you're more focused on the cash flow aspect. If appreciation happens, that's great, but that's definitely not the focus, right? Right. And you know, a lot of most investors don't invest like this, right? The amateurs, they just invest off of appreciation. And, you know, I kind of discovered like, you know, a lot of things I think we'll talk about today are very counterintuitive of how the wealthy do things. Um, one of the biggest mistakes and misnomers I think people, when they think about average Joe finances is most people go off of this accumulation theory, right? You save up two to $4 million, right? And, and you can retire and live off that big pile of money. But let's think about it. Once you get up to that point, you want to switch to more of an end game strategy, which is cash flow. You don't want to just eat at that pile and that pile goes away. You want to convert right. that pile to cash flow. And that's exactly what we're doing today. Every little syndication deal or, or rental property we buy are assets that produce cash flow for us. And the cool thing, for at least for a lot of my clients, is that we, they can pick up these cash flow streams, but they don't need to eat that cash flow stream today. They have good paying jobs, and those cash flow streams can go to buy more and more cash flow streams, essentially creating multiple mini pensions for themselves. Right. You, you almost create a, an infinite way to keep uh, funding, you know, what you're trying to do and, and, and keep building up this passive cash flow. So, so for folks that are looking to start investing and they want to start buying some of these cash flow properties, what, what type of class should they consider when they're looking at, at different properties to invest in? Should they consider, uh, class A, class B, or class C assets? What, what, do, what do you focus yeah, on? Yeah, so we kind of stay in the middle, right? We don't go to the luxury high end because they're, you don't, the numbers don't work. You're not going to hit the rent to value ratios needed to cash flow. And in times of recession, the, a lot of times those people hurt the most, which obviously didn't happen in COVID, right? The high end pretty much unfazed, maybe had the inconvenience by having to get their grub hub a little bit more than they'd like. This right. time. But traditionally, the high end get hit and they come back to more value based apartments, which we kind of focus on today. Um, we try and stay away from the war zone properties, the D and the C type of stuff, because collections are really hard in that area. When I mean collections, tenants just don't pay rent on a super high frequency. Um, normally, we collect 97% of the, of the rent. So there's 3% exception rate in there. But when you start to get into the really bad Class C properties, you know, it's dangerous areas and you know you're, trying, you're not collecting maybe collecting around in the 80 percent range and that that can really hurt 
market share, bottom line. Right. And 97%, uh, that, that's really good. So if that's, if that's what your goal is, then that's, that's a, a great spot to be in. So do you, I guess maybe you're looking more at like C plus and B uh, properties is, is where your focus is at, or do you even just, do you just stay with class? B? Yeah. I mean, in the beginning we, we did a lot of class C stuff cause you know, when we're starting out, that's all we were able to get access to. They're cheaper. Um, we, a lot of other investors know class B or sophisticated investors know class B's are like the sweet spot. Right. So, but we had to kind of earn our stripes and kind of step up to that. So we, we did some class C assets at the beginning that we eventually sold. Um, but today, you know, if I, if I had, or have my way, I do a class B, B plus asset in a better area, but you know, we diversify, right? Not every deal is unique, right? But that's the idea where we try and stick to. Right on. Okay. So are, are, are you mostly investing in like apartments and, and, uh, you know, multifamily, are you doing like syndications? Is, what, what, what investments are you currently doing right now? Kind of just follow my story. Like in 2015, I had 11 of these single family home rentals scattered across the country, five in Atlanta, four in Birmingham, one in Indianapolis, Indiana, and another one in Pennsylvania or so. But it's, I started to realize that these properties, um, I mean, it was working, right? A few hundred bucks of cash flow every month for each of these properties. That was cash flowing maybe $3,000 a year, and which is pretty awesome, right? I mean, who wouldn't want that? But I don't know what American family can survive off $3,000 a month. We're needing more like 10000 And with those 11 properties, just to give people a sense, I mean, again, we have property managers to do our dirty work for us. I don't advocate anybody to be doing the landlording on the home. But as the asset manager role, I had maybe an eviction every two or one or two a year, maybe some kind of big catastrophe that happened every quarter, every few months, like a tree falling on the house or some type of issue with like the plumbing repair or something like that, which is no problem because the property manager takes care of all that. But if I needed ten thousand dollars a month, I, you get to multiply that by three to get thirty houses, and now it becomes quickly unscalable. So around this time, I started searching for that next thing. Right as you know, I was kind of in my late twenties, and I was kind of realizing, like, what's next, right? And I started to join different higher level masterminds, get around other accredited high net worth individuals, and I started to realize that they invest in these private placements and syndications country club deals that go into and buy a large syndicated apartment. The LPs, passive investors, there's not really any liability for them. They're there with the loans in their name and you have professionals kind of running your deal for you. That's kind of what I've been transitioning to um, after 2016. Right on. So, okay. So since we're talking about syndications, right there, there's, there's a lot that goes with that, especially for somebody that's coming in as a limited partner, uh, to to understand the the type of deal that they're getting into, right? So there's uh, different things that they need to know about the the uh, unit or the the apartment or whatever that uh, property is that you're going to syndicate. There are different things that you need to know about it, right? And and you learn about that when you get the pro forma, right? So what what are the top things someone should consider in the assumptions in a pro forma pitch deck? Well, I mean, a lot of times the performa is, you know, performa is kind of made up stuff, right? It's kind of right. it's toilet paper in French. <laughs> um, and quite frankly, anybody can create a syndicated deal these days, right? And anybody can create a webinar and a pitch deck. It ultimately comes down to verifying that track record of the operator. So this is where your network comes into play, knowing other high net worth, pure passive investors actually invested with these people in the past. But maybe you don't have that. I never had that when I first started. Um, but, you know, as if you own some rental properties, at least you have a fighting chance of kind of determining what you see there on paper. Is this legit? Right. All right. They're buying this property for $60,000 per unit. Average rents on this property is six fifty. dollars Right. Ding. I already should know. Right. 1% rent to value ratio. So I already know this thing shouldn't be cash flowing at that point. Right. So that's kind of the basic preliminary information that an investor should know. But, you know, after that, you're kind of making spot checking. Hey, are some of the assumptions that the sponsor is making, are they responsible and are they conservative in nature? Even though they may be rattling off the top of their head, conservative, conservative, conservative in the deal pitch. Are they really using the right numbers? Right. That's a you as the passive investor 
need to verify. I, I think some of the important takeaways from that, uh, you know, which which was I, I thought was uh, fantastic, is you have to be educated, right? You have to understand what it is that you're looking at because anybody could sit here and sell you a snake oil, right? And you could sit there and get yes to death all day. Um, but also your your network, right? Your network is important. Making sure that you're associating yourself uh, yourself with the right individuals, right? So when you're looking at these deals, if you have somebody in your network that's in it and you know that they've been doing this for a while or, you know, like you said, another high net worth individual that is investing, uh, that has invested with this partner in the past, it can kind of give you more of that warm and fuzzy that you're looking at uh, a legitimate deal, right? Because I see it all the time on social media and, and all the all the different Facebook groups that I'm in is, you know, uh, all these deals that are popping up and and I've had a couple emailed to me and I'm looking at them. I'm just like this this doesn't get feel right. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, this, <laughs> but this, this one's, you know, it makes, makes the hairs on the back of your neck stick up and, and it's probably not something you want to involve yourself in. So uh, the other thing that you mentioned too is, you know, just because they're saying they're being conservative, are they really being conservative? What do the numbers show? Cause the numbers are going to prove it to you, right? If they're being conservative or not. So uh, as a matter of fact, um, I, I just interviewed somebody last night and we were talking about, you know, how conservative they are when they look at their deals. And uh, some of the way that they they work their numbers is way more conservative than I've seen other successful syndicators doing it. So that, you know, when you talk to people like that, it's okay. I'm a little more comfortable working with that individual when I know that they're really being conservative about it and not just fudging the numbers to to give you something that looks better on paper. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Um, unfortunately, as a passive investor, a lot of this is is never in the pitch deck, right? Right. You need really. I mean, my due diligence process is a little bit different than most investors because I know how to analyze deals. So I pull the rent rolls and the profit and loss statements, the trailing financials, and I can put it into my analyzer. And what I'm doing is I'm applying my set of assumptions to make sure I'm getting the, the same number at the bottom of the page or better. And if not, if, if I, and I can kind of tell what they're using for assumptions, right? Are they assuming that the rents are going to go up 3% every year? Well, that sure is heck not going to happen in my opinion, right? Number, my number is going to ultimately be lower. Um, and at that point, I wouldn't waste my time talking to that operator, right? Um, but at this point, I kind of rely a lot on my network, right? What, what deals have they been putting their own money into and who's been actually performing? Quite frankly, I mean, most, I never had it when I first started. I mean, that's why I've, been, I've invested with some bad people in the past, but that's just how it goes. This may not be for you, and but this is how accredited investors invest. Right on. Okay. So speaking of accredited investors, right? So there's um, a lot of people that probably listen to the show that, that won't qualify as a, an accredited investor, right? So there's another topic that I want to talk about with you, but something that, um, that was on your information that I was interested in. And that was having uh, an emergency fund 2.0. So can you, I've heard you talk about it on, on different podcasts. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, m- more recently uh, as a guest on a show that I listened to the Chris miles money show. And uh, I'm curious if if you can tell me what an emergency fund 2.0 is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's kind of preface this, right. Cause maybe we kind of glaze over in the beginning, but the stuff sure. I do, the people I work with, you know, we're not broke, right? We got money. Right. A lot of us make six figures at our day jobs or you know, certainly have, have at least a quarter million dollars net worth. If you're in credit card debt, don't listen to the thing I'm saying. <laughs> don't listen. To <laughs> right it, on. Right. You know, that's what all these like free online forms are for. That's what the local RIAs are for. There's a bunch of people who want to flip houses, wholesale houses, get rich quick. Right. The kind of investing I do, the simple passive cash flow way is the shortest amount of time for you to focus on your highest and best use, which might be unfortunately at your day job that you don't like, right? How do you grow your net worth the fastest and safest way? You know, with that said, you know, like that's why we, you know, for folks under a quarter million dollars net worth, we say, go get a turnkey remote rental, something that's 1% rent to value ratio better than cash flows. Your net worth is higher. Maybe consider a syndication or at least start, start, to learn but as far as emergency savings go right like for most people in this world and again i don't want to offend anybody but for those of people who are a little bit more financially um, younger right 
where they have difficulty saving money. Most of my clients, again, that save at least ten to twenty thousand dollars, the very least, every single year. Some are fifty, a hundred thousand dollars per year after all their expenses. But there's a paradigm shift right here, right? So folks who make less than that certain threshold, right? You're going to need an emergency in the savings account because things are going to happen and it's going to knock you on your on your on your butt, right? right? But for the higher net worth guys, the guys who are kind of my cohort. Right, like you, we're switching from the scarcity mindset of emergency saving to an opportunity fund, right? Because we're we've got fifty grand, two hundred grand lying on the sidelines, just spraying at a deal as it comes up, right? But you don't want to just sit in our checking account making zero percent. I always have less than like ten, twenty grand in my checking account, right? I call it like liquidity anxiety. If you have that much money sitting there doing nothing, or more than a hundred grand in your home equity home equity as debt equity, not doing anything, you should be sweating. You should be very nervous in my opinion, right? right? But where do you put the money in the meantime as you're loading up for the next investment or syndicated okay deal, right? So that's what this, this idea, this opportunity fund comes into play. Where are you storing your money? So, you know, some places I like are actually been sponsored by these guys, AHP fund. They can go to my website, watch all the videos of that. But it's just a private note fund that gives 10% on funds invested paid monthly. Some people will do private money lending. I've been tinkering around a little bit with BlockFi at 8.6%. There are pref equity um, opportunities in large syndicated deals where you just get a nice coupon, eight to 12% paid monthly. Um, you know, those short term type of deals where you can kind of have it in semi liquidity mode. Or where you can get at it maybe a couple a couple days to a few couple months maybe. Um, another thing that a high net worth strategy that we like to employ is infinite banking, which is using whole life insurance. Again, if you guys are less than half a million dollars net worth, do not even think about doing these things quite yet. In fact, it'll just confuse you guys. You guys should be putting your money into investments to grow your net worth. But if you guys are accredited status or half a million dollar net worth and above, something to think about, right? Because now it allows you to put your money into a whole life contract and then you take a loan from it, right? So this is something a lot of my guys will do. They'll load several hundred thousand dollars in there. And as the deal comes up, they take a loan from themselves, paying interest to themselves. And then they can put that money into a deal. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that a couple of times and it's a good way to double dip, right? On on that cash that you had just sitting around, right? So not only are you, you getting the, uh, the return from having it sit in that whole life insurance policy, but you're also paying back yourself interest. And at the same time, the money that you took out as a loan, you're, you're getting a return on that investment too, because you, you know, likely put it into something else that's, that's giving you a, a higher return than, than even what you're paying yourself back in, in interest. Let's take a brief moment to hear from our show sponsors. What's going on, everybody? So I am happy to announce that we now have our video and audio editing services live. So whether you're starting a brand new YouTube channel or a podcast, or you're already established, we have services that'll fit your needs. Go check it out, www.averagejoefinances.com slash services, and you can see all the services that we have to offer, including our newest audio and video editing. What's going on, everybody? So I know there's a lot of busy individuals out there like myself. I find myself sometimes struggling with time management when I'm dealing with things with my blog, my podcast, managing my social media accounts. Sometimes it can be really taxing and time consuming. So one of the things I started doing recently that has been super helpful is outsourcing some of this work to subcontractors and freelancers. And I'm doing that through a website called Fiverr. I have a link in the podcast description below that will take you to Fiverr and give you a discount up to $100 off your first order with them. Check it out. It's been a lifesaver for me. It's been saving me a lot of time and a lot of stress. And I really think it could do the same for you. Check out the link below or go to www.averagejoefinances.com slash Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. Let's get back to today's episode. Right. It's great strategy. I mean, ask protection too. Once it's in there, it's kind of off the table of litigators. It grows tax free. And that's the loophole, right? Because right. it's life insurance, government does can't tax that thing. But it is, there are some cons to it, right? I mean, and that's kind of the role that we play as the family office coordinator here. 
depends on your situation and where you are with your finances because there's fees, obviously, right? Insurance, like anything, has fees and it's front loaded. So there's a sort of a, a certain amount uh, that is ranges for different people in different situations where it makes sense. Right. Okay. So there's another thing I want to talk to you about too. I, I guess it, it kind of, it's similar to that because it involves um, somebody using their 401k or retirement funds, right? So this is kind of like a, I guess a two-part question or just two questions that tie into each other, right? So how does someone strategically take out their 401k or retirement funds uh, by managing their adjusted gross income? Also, why don't people use their retirement funds to invest and take advantage of cost segregations and bonus depreciation? Yeah, so I guess we'll kind of start this at the top and we'll preface it saying that this is very counterintuitive to anything you guys have heard in the past. But I've, uh, I mean, I've kind of seen the light and kind of see how the high net worth wealthy do things. And they do not really use these retirement funds, these 401ks, even self-directed IRAs and self-directed Roths because of some of these, these pitfalls. And we'll kind of go through it slowly here to kind of unpack it. But of course, every situation is different, right? So you may be in a situation where it will make sense for you. And maybe we'll try and piece that out here at the end. But you know, first reason why we don't invest via retirement accounts or qualified retirement plans is like a lot of fi- normal financial advice is predicated on putting your job age 60, age 70, and your income going way down, and then you'll be in a lower tax bracket. I makes sense logically, but let's stop and actually think and question things for once, right? So just listening to the dogma. I am going to make a lot more money in the future. I don't know about you, Mike, but I think you're kind of, you're on the same trajectory, right? Therefore, your tax bracket will be higher in the future than it is today, relatively speaking. Therefore, it makes sense to pay your taxes today, get it out of that garbage cafeteria, get it out and into real investments. So that's point number one. Point number two, how else are we going to pay for all these in government entitlement programs, right? Taxes from tax practice are going to go up in the future. So second reason, get your taxes out now. Third reason, you know, like I think where um, a lot of these people, like they think, they say, well, when your money's in these retirement funds, you're getting the tax-free growth. Yes, but when you're also investing in real estate or these good tax advantage types of investments, you're not getting the tax, you're not getting the tax benefits that you are when going into these investments. When I go into a deal, we're doing a cost segregation, we're pulling out this huge amount of bonus depreciation, paper losses after the asset. If you're investing via a retirement account, you're insulated from that. You do not get those retire those those benefits. And this is the key thing. And this is how the wealthy play the game differently. They use these tax benefits to possibly lower their ordinary income. So I have a lot of doctor clients that they may make 600 grand a year. And what we try and do is we try and bring them below that $330,000 a year mark, because that's kind of the big jump from 24 to 30, 32%. So we're doing, we're trying to bring them as, as close as that as possible. Um, so they're not getting killed. So it may make sense to use up some of these passive activity losses, bring them, turn them from being suspended losses into lowering our ordinary income for those type of individuals. And you can't manipulate, you can't do these levers if you're doing this all within your retirement account. And then the last reason why, you know, you don't want to use these retirement accounts because you can't use the damn thing until you're like 60 or 70 years old. I mean, most of my clients are able to get financially free well before you know, 10 years doing this stuff, depending on where they start. I mean, that's probably a lot sooner than the, t- the time you can actually use that money. But the, the only situation where I would recommend a retirement account to a client is, let's just say they are in that highest tax bracket. They do make over $330,000 and they have a lot of money in their retirement funds, probably more than half a million dollars. At that point, we'd probably consider a qualified retirement plan or solo for 1K for them. But that's a kind of a rare situation. I know you're talking about some of these upfront, you know, you're, you know, pay your taxes now instead of in the future. But what about for the folks that are doing like Roth IRAs uh, and, and things like that, where, you know, they're paying the taxes up front and then when they go to withdraw it, it's, it's, you know, now it's tax free money. But again, like you said, uh, now you're waiting until you're 60 plus years old to, to withdraw this money. But what, what would you say to somebody that's, that's more focused on, Hey, I want to, I want to invest into my Roth IRA instead of any other type of traditional investment. 
what would you say to those folks? Because they're not going to be paying that, you know, in that higher tax bracket when they withdraw that money. Well, they're paying it now, right? And I think that we're kind of arguing about two different right. things. I think people get really confused with this a lot of times. But when you load your money into a retirement account, even a Roth account, the problem with that stuff is you're getting stuck in the cafeteria of crappy investment options, right? I invest more in deals where I'm direct to the sponsor and sponsor myself, right? Or rental properties, right? Where it's direct to ownership. What's really frustrating about like the financial world out there is like these products, they're all financial products, like 401ks, mutual funds. They're all like, there's so much middlemen going into all these products, which all thing makes Wall Street rich. How also are they having all these large salaries and heart and high you know, big buildings. I mean, this is essentially what made my parents have doctor and, and master's degrees, but they were never able to get ahead, right? Even they worked their butts off. And it's because they're stuck in these retail type of investments where everybody in the everybody is taking money from them as a middle, right? And this is where like, when take I'll take you back to my first rental property. That first property wasn't the greatest in my opinion. But I was making like 20 or 30% of my money when you take into the cash flow, the tax benefits, the tenants paying on my mortgage for me, and the little appreciation that I was getting. And then I look at my 401k, my stocks, mutual funds, and suppose you're only going to get 8 to 10% there. So I think to myself, like, what the heck happened to all my money? 20 to 30% here? And if you don't believe me, go to my website, I have a video where I do the whiteboard geeky exercise of doing all the math for you, right? Uh, I think that's. A, oh no! I, I believe that. I've, I've felt that with with my rental properties too. So for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's real, guys. You're making a lot more money when you're doing it that way, and you're only making eight to ten percent in this all this garbage stuff. It's kind of like in high school where you know you, you didn't have that off campus pass as an underclassman, and you're stuck with this crappy cafeteria of options in there, right? Once you get an off campus pass, you're like, peace out. I'm out of here, right? Well, by staying in these like retirement funds, these Roth IRAs, you're stuck with these crap investments, the Vanguards, the Fidelities, the, you know, all these like, these are all fee laden products, right? Get your off campus pass and get your money out of there. Jill, break your money out of your retirement and go actually invest or go buy the better food outside the cafeteria. Yeah, right on. So I, I kind of got yelled at a little bit by some other people about this, but I, I had the opportunity to pull some money out of my thrift savings plan, right? Uh, due to the CARES Act. And I was like, you know what? I want to take this out and invest it in real estate instead. And uh, some people were getting frustrated with me about it, but I was like, I, I can get a much better return, you know, if I took this cash and put it into a real estate asset versus letting it sit here in the, in the thrift savings plan, you know, barely earning, you know, 10 to 12%. Uh, where I can get a, you know, almost 20% plus, uh, you know, cash on cash return on my investment. So I, I mean, be I believe in that. I believe in that. That's why sure. we do what we do, right? Because <laughs> yeah. this is frustrating because you and I have to fight up this uphill battle of all this financial dogma, how our parents do it, how our parents right. taught us, how society wants us to do it, what Cliff and Rob are doing in the cubicle land next to us, right? Like number one rule of, of like financial freedom is never listen to anybody who's not financially free. If they have a job, don't listen to them because they're doing it wrong, right? And this could even right. mean your CPA, your financial planner, like they all have jobs, right? Oh yeah, my, my financial advisor's not financially happy, free. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's funny because uh, the same me a year ago coming to me right now would say, what are you doing? You're an idiot. Why are you taking your money out of your, your thrift savings plan? Why are you pulling it out right now? And you know, the funny thing is the amount of money that I took out, um, I, didn't, I didn't have to pay any penalties on it, but I only had to claim a very, very small amount as uh, income this year. And I was, a, I was even able to take that small amount and break it, break it up over the next three years as well. So I only claimed one third of that, uh, you know, this year's income. And then the rest of it is going to be, you know, over the next uh, two years. So uh, that really helped out as well. And uh, I, I didn't have to pay nearly as much in taxes this year than I, that I thought I was going to have to. So that worked out yeah. pretty good. I mean, what Mike's talking about, guys, is the 100K CARES Act um, mm -hmm. withdrawal. Like, guys, it's a no brainer. Get it out there. This, they're not, you have to pay the taxes on it, like, as you always have to when you take it to, as income, because you always have to pay taxes at some point. Again, I'd rather pay taxes on it now than later. But right. like, with the CARES Act thing, you're able to get away from the 10% penalty. 
I, I like, think it's expired now, though. I think uh, it was December fifteenth. I think was the cutoff. So uh, unless I think they you're right, it, yeah. But I mean, the argument I'm trying to make is like, look, guys, it doesn't matter. Like they call it penalty for a reason because they yeah. don't want you to think, ooh, it's a penalty, right? Ooh. Yeah. Who cares? You're going to beat that. You're going to beat that ten percent in like six months. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also caught some flack too because I took out a loan against my TSP a while back to to buy a property, um, and and I was told like, oh, what are you doing? I was like, you know, what, as I'm paying this loan back and the interest that I'm paying on it, I'm actually paying myself. It's not, you know, it's not even like I'm paying interest to a bank or anything like that. So, and it was for a very small amount too. So it was like two percent is what I had to pay it back. It was whatever the the current G fund is at the time. So uh, to me, it was, again, it was one of those things to me that when I looked at it and I looked at the numbers, I was like, this is a no brainer. This is, it's my money. I can borrow it from myself and pay it back. It's, you know, similar to the, to the way you were talking about doing with the life insurance, uh, but the life insurance way is a a much better way to do it because you're getting a a higher return. But uh, it was, it was a way for me to do it as a, as a smaller, a smaller fry. Right. Um, And I I had the same like quantum in the beginning, like, yeah, it's like, Ooh, I can't. I shouldn't take money out of my TSP or 401k. It's a sin, right? We've all been taught that. Yeah. Like, it's naughty. You're not supposed to do it. Run the numbers yourself and don't get like influenced by all these people that don't know what they're talking about. Like, yeah, right do on. the numbers on your own and think for yourself. And the numbers will tell you what to do. Exactly. That's why I'm trying to be like you when I grow up, Lane. <laughs> for sure. I'm just copying what other super rich people are doing. Yeah. And yeah, it's absolutely. not super complicated. It's a proven formula, right? Yeah. What they're it's just doing is very works. counterintuitive to what we've all been taught. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So um, I mean, we can go on on this stuff all day. This is, this is awesome. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, besides real estate, which you're absolutely crushing it there. Uh, what are some other asset classes that you, you personally, uh, yourself invest in? Do you, are you involved in uh, any paper assets, like in the stock market at all or anything like that? What, what, what other assets do you invest in? I mean, I like businesses and pretty much hard assets. I mean, in, I mean, I, I, I operate apartment buildings, apartment syndications. I also like other asset classes such as self-storage, office space, uh, mobile home parks, uh, like the theme there is like it's workforce housing, right? It's in it's for the majority of people, the bell curve of America. It's you know right. something in a recession that demand should stay stay strong or get even stronger for. That's what I know. So that's what I primarily invest in. But if you're kind of twisting my arm, like what else am I? I'm starting to do some oil and gas. So I do some. I like life settlement investing. Um, again, that's more for like the. More people at end game strategy, you know, folks other two or three million dollar network, in my opinion. So you really want to diversify your portfolio. But I, I definitely don't like fake assets, right? Like paper assets. I definitely don't like that type of stuff. I like hard assets that are leverageable and give me good tax benefits. Right. I think one of the key things you said too is uh, the the stuff that you're investing is 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 essentially recession proof, right? It's it's something that even when we take a hard hit to the economy. You're still, uh, you're still getting your cash flow. You're still getting a return, you know, an ROI. One of the things that I really like about real estate, probably more than anything else, and it's it's very simple. It's a very simple way to look at it. Is, you know, people will always need a place to live. You know, you're not always going to need to dump money into a company. Uh, a company's not always going to need your money. I mean, they'll take your money, but you know, putting putting money into real estate, into real assets, like you're talking about, not paper assets, but real assets. It's something that's it's tangible. It's there and, and it's a, it's a need. It's not a want, it's a need. It's a requirement for, you know, for people to survive. And, and in this country, like our, our population is growing in immigration, population growth, and we have a greater need for that lower end, you know, the rents between $700 and $1,200 a month. It's not on the high end. It's right. On that kind of that middle lower class is what we need more of. And we don't mean the government's kind of stimulating that in little ways better loans um, and different zoning requirements these days. Um, it's just, it, to me, it's a no brainer, right? And yeah. add that to your whole argument of, you know, they're not making any more of that too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, hey, Lane, this, this has been uh, fantastic. I think you've uh, dropped some uh, phenomenal uh, nuggets of wisdom here. Uh, I, I really, <laughs> I'm really excited. I, I, again, I could probably talk to you all day about this stuff. 
But I've, I've got one more question I want to ask you, and, and this is the important one, especially for the folks that are listening that want to get involved and, and maybe get to know you a little bit more. And that is where can people find more information about you? Uh, do you have a website or social media you can share? I, we've already shared, you know, three of those websites and I'll make sure I get that in the show notes, but where else can people find you? Um, they can go to my podcast, Simple Passive Cash Flow, uh, Passive Investing, iTunes, Google Play, et cetera. And then my website is simplepassivecashflow.com. You know, I think a lot of folks just trying to get started, start with a, like a turnkey rental, right? A lot of these guys will fix up properties for you and put a tenant in there for you. Great way to get started. That's how I got started. We go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash turnkey. And uh, if you're in Hawaii, you know, Maybe when one day we start to do the in-person meetups again. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, for sure. We'll see you out there. But if not, find me on the interwebs. The interwebs. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, you know, I, actually, you know, one more thing that even even here with the final thing here, you're still leaving another little golden nugget. And that is uh, you don't hear a lot of people talk about it too much, especially uh, for newer real estate investors. And you said to go find a turnkey property. And I just want to ask you just uh, personally out of curiosity, why would you say to go buy a turnkey property versus maybe a distressed property that you can fix up and maybe get a, uh, you know, be able to pull that money back out, like using the Burr method or something like that. Why would you say to go get a turnkey property? Well, I mean, it's kind of like, would you, do, if you don't know how to swim, you never swam before. Do you go jump on the shallow end of the pool or the deep side, right? A turnkey allows you to kind of get into a property and operate it and kind of put training wheels on. Right. Or so start by dipping is, your toes instead of just diving into the deep end. Right. And I'm not a big fan of the burst strategy personally, especially because most of my clientele, they make over 50, 60 grand a year. Right. Now, if you don't have that much money, yeah, you're going to have to take on some risks and burst take a lot of time. And to me, a lot of our highest and best use is not doing that type of stuff. It's just buying and holding. I mean, maybe that's how I did it. Right. Like I never really did burst. I just, it just took me a while, like from 2009 when, when I bought my first property and I just saved my money, bought a property every year, essentially. Right. I, I get it. Not everybody can save 50 grand a year, but that's what I did. And I didn't really take chances along my route. I don't know. It's now the time when you want to be doing the burst strategy, because I mean, we've been in a bull market for the last dozen years. At some point it's got to go down. So right. that's the straight off, right? At least go on eyes wide open. People want to do the birds. You can go to my website, look at the, the cons of birds. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, especially if okay. your net worth is over a quarter million. No, that's that's great. It's it's great to have a you know a different point of view. You know, from the the standard, you know what you hear all the time on on many other podcasts about, and even even on my own, because I've brought people on that talk about how they do burn everything. So it's always good to see it from another point of view and perspective. So the folks that are listening right now can can make a better decision based on what works best for them. Right. And I really like what, what you're doing and how you started off too, because you started off while you were still doing your, your nine to five. Right. And uh, being a busy individual, you can't just jump in and start renovating a place. Right. I, I kind of ran into this problem too, with the property that I bought last year and uh, it needed a lot of work. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, you know, and being in the military, I wasn't able to fly back to Virginia to do anything. So I'm sitting here doing everything sight unseen, hiring all these people to come out and contractors to do work on a property that uh, I never even seen before. So, yeah, I definitely yeah. Uh, I definitely have felt that pain. Uh, so I, I definitely appreciate that perspective. A hundred percent. So even even on the way out, you're you're dropping some some good knowledge here. And I, I definitely appreciate that. Hey, man, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, even, you know, even though you're local um, and we're doing it on the weekend, it's good to be talking to somebody that I know that the sun's in the same spot in the sky as, as we're chatting. Uh, so, uh, again, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and talking with me today. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My computer is like facing the same direction that you are. About, <laughs> so I feel like you're really talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, maybe you're facing the same way. And so I'm kind of talking to you about Maybe. Maybe. I feel like I'm talking to you. I don't know, but as soon as we can do some stuff in, in, in person, I definitely, uh, we should get together and uh, I, I go out to some of the meetups out here and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting you in person one of these days. Yeah. Cool, Mike. All right. Hey, thanks for coming on.